Hello, my name is Jill Osborne. I'm the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is May 2016, and here I am in my office. I would love to introduce a new concept to the IC patient community, a con the concept of subtyping or phenotyping. Now, we have long known that there's tremendous diversity in the IC patient population. Some patients can have profound bladder wall damage, while others have absolutely a normal bladder. Both are struggling with symptoms of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. Both have been diagnosed to IC up to this point, and yet clearly they're very, very different patients. We also know that the, uh, some patients have related conditions that other patients don't have, like irritable bowel, and then other patients are struggling with muscle disorders, a pelvic floor muscle disorder specifically. So there's clearly tremendous tremendous variation in the patient population. And so for the last five or so years, clinicians and researchers around the country have been working to understand and develop these subtypes so that they can better diagnose patients and point them to more effective therapies. And it began with Dr. Dan Shoskis and Dr. Curtis Nickel, who proposed a phenotyping system called U-Point. And in the U-point system, they asked doctors to not just look at the bladder, bladder symptoms in the bladder wall, but to also assess for infection, related conditions, muscle dysfunction, et cetera, et cetera. And I will tell you, we in the patient community were thrilled to see that because it felt like for the first time, doctors were going to start looking at us as more than just a bladder. You know, many of us, myself included, have had many other things going on, particularly the related conditions. And so to have a tool that would include that was very, very important. Um, the second group that is attempting to subtype is the MAP Research Network, the big federally funded multidisciplinary approach to the study of pelvic pain research network. This is a very robust, large research team, and their data to this point has been really exceptional. We're learning so much about IC, but they're very slow and fastidious. So up to this point, they're talking about basically two subtypes, Hunter's lesions versus non-Hunter's lesions. And that makes sense. And in fact, it was the European Society for the Study of IC that started doing that also. They also focus on identifying lesions versus no lesions. But last year, Dr. Christopher Payne, formerly of Stanford University, he was the Stanford Director of Female Urology as well as their IC Research Director for 20 years. Um, he's now in private practice at Vista Urology in San Jose, California. He proposed a subtypes that I think worked perfectly. I think he nailed it, and he nailed it to the point that now, with almost every patient that I coach or work with over the phone, we talk about his subtypes. So that's what I want to introduce to you, to you today, are his subtypes. And hopefully, at the end of this video, you'll be able to perhaps subtype yourself, and that might help you understand why you uh, are not progressing with certain therapies. Okay, so let's go over them. Subtype number one is Hunter's lesions. This makes total sense because when we biopsy a lesion, it's filled with inflammation. A normal IC patient without lesions don't have those biopsy findings. And it was the European Society for IC that really focused on that. So everybody pretty much agrees that Hunter's lesions are very separate and distinct. Luckily, only 5% of patients, the overall patients, usually have them. Uh, they tend to be the more severe patients. These patients have trouble sleeping. They tend to be very diet limited, struggle with a lot of pain, some bleeding. Uh, interestingly, though, researchers in Belgium uh, about a year and a half ago released a study in which they found the polyoma virus in the urine of patients with Hunter's lesions. Now, this is early. This is not accepted uh, across, a, across the urology community as fact, but it, it is very suggestive and it will be very, very interesting if other IC research centers also find this virus because it would explain why they keep flaring and why they don't respond to therapy. So if you have Hunter's lesions, it's very, very important that you come to our website, read the section on Hunter's lesions therapies, because Hunter's lesions generally don't respond to oral medications like Elmeron. Uh, Hunter's lesions require very, very specific therapies like fulguration, laser therapy, triamcinolone injections, 
Or we have a new medical device under study called Lyris or Linka that is the first treatment to heal a hunter's lesion in two weeks. Now that research is still pending, that doesn't work for everyone, but it is indeed a very, very promising breakthrough for the treatment of hunter's lesions. Okay, subtype number one. Subtype number two is bladder wall injury. So these are the patients whose symptoms began after some sort of direct bladder trauma. UTI, chemotherapy, a decade of drinking diet soda. You know, the bladder, like any other part of the body, can be hurt. And unfortunately, when it's hurt, that allows urine. And remember, urine is composed of toxins. Urine is body waste. So it's got ammonia and urea in it. When these substances get into the bladder wall, they create tremendous irritation, especially of nerves. And that is what drives the symptoms of frequency urgency. The way we know that the bladder is behind those symptoms is when pain occurs. If you have pain as the bladder fills with urine that is relieved with urination, you feel better after you pee, that generally points to the bladder wall as a source of your pain and discomfort. And clearly, if you have this, diet modification is critical, just like it is critical for patients who have Hunter's lesions. You go to our website and look at the six-step treatment protocol that's really built for people with bladder wall-driven symptoms, all right? Subtype number three, pelvic floor injury. So these are the patients whose symptoms began after some sort of direct pelvic floor trauma. Having a baby, a car accident, a fall, a rape, a decade of uh, being an athlete, riding bicycles for a long period of time. You know, many patients simply don't believe that muscles can cause bladder pain or bladder symptoms, but they can because the pelvic floor gently holds the bladder and other pelvic organs in place. You know, the pelvic floor is like a woven basket of muscles. You've got muscles that go from the left to the right, from the front to the back, and low to high. And if some of those are tight, what do they do? They start squeezing blood vessels and nerves. And when you deprive the bladder of, of um, blood flow, you're reducing the ability of the bladder wall to function normally. We kind of end up in a chicken versus the egg scenario though. You know, which comes first, the chicken for the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder wall or the pelvic floor? Um, for many patients, it starts with a bladder injury. And then because the bladder is hurting, the body tries to protect it through a guarding reflex. And that guarding reflex means that it's tightening muscles. So the pelvic floor muscles will often become very tight. On the other hand, for some people, it begins with that pelvic injury. And when those pelvic floor muscles are tight, that reduces blood flow to the bladder, causes other issues with the bladder, and then the bladder starts becoming involved. So one of the secrets, I think, to kind of understanding treatment and self-care is to, is to think about what the triggering event could have been. So for example, I was working with an Ironman athlete um, whose symptoms developed. I mean, here you've got one of the fittest athletes in the world, right? And just out of the blue, he started really struggling with what he thought was prostate pain. All of his cultures were negative. And for a year, he did prostate therapies and IC therapies to really no avail. And when we were talking, you know, he didn't have that classic symptom of pain as the bladder fills. He was struggling with pain afterwards. He finally went and got a pelvic floor assessment and was stunned to discover that he actually had a pelvic floor injury. I will also say this, the single most effective treatment ever studied for IC was not an oral medication like Elmeron. It was not a bladder treatment like DMSO. The single most effective therapy ever studied for IC was in fact pelvic floor physical therapy. When that study came out, it turned the IC world on its head because everybody had to, at that point, accept that muscles can be a big part of our problem. All right? Okay, subtype number four is pudendal nerve entrapment. These patients have muscles so tight, they're squeezing nerves, particularly the pudendal nerve. Their symptoms are often positional in nature. So they generally sleep really well, but when they sit on the side of their bed every morning, the pain starts and it's electrical pain. It can shoot down their legs or, or uh, it's just kind of a searing hot electrical pain. They might be fine standing, but if they bend over and squat down, uh, that's when their pain will trigger too. So if movement triggers that pain, we're again going to be looking at muscles and at that point in time, nerves if it's nerve-related pain. 
The last subtype is the most interesting subtype. It's called functional somatic syndrome, also known as central sensi sensitization syndrome. This is the syndrome that really involves patients with the related conditions, like the IBS and the vulvodynia and the prostatodynia. Patients with functional somatic syndrome have very sensitive skin. I'm one of them. I can only wear cotton. Any other fabric drives me crazy. Um, we tend to be food sensitive, where there are some foods that just don't work in our body. Like if I do drink caffeine, which I don't, I try not to, I shake like a leaf. Um, we tend to be drug sensitive, where a normal dose of a medication is often too strong for us. We tend to be smell sensitive, where we can smell things that other people can't smell, and smells really drive us crazy sometimes. We can be chemically sensitive, and we are even visually sensitive, where if there's a funky pattern in a carpet or wallpaper, we have to close our eyes and turn away. Functional somatic syndrome really means that that patient has an exquisitely sensitive nervous system. Sometimes it's inherited. It's inherit, I believe it's inherited in my case because my mother, my grandmother, my sister, my cousins, we all have this. And I'm a redhead, so that kind of makes sense. But it can also happen after a major injury. I mean, for people who break a leg, you know that after the bone heals, that area often remains sensitive because that's what traumatized nerves do. They, they become more sensitive. They become easier to turn on. And so for a patient with functional somatic syndrome, our, our therapeutic goal is to not traumatize. We don't want to turn nerves on. We want to calm things down. So from a self-help self standpoint, we're going to avoid caffeine. We're going to avoid neurostimulatory products. We're going to focus on stress management and living a, a, a perhaps maybe a quieter life is a, is a way to say it. I know that for me, I don't thrive in an urban setting. It's just too much stimulation. I'm much more comfortable in the country. Um, so, and then also, I, I just have to say that um, Doctors tend to approach patients with functional somatic syndrome with great caution. I interviewed Dr. Ken Peters last summer about this, and I said, what do you do when you have a patient who's walking in with, with this exquisitely sensitive nervous system? And he, he basically said, I back away and I'm very, very careful. You know, we don't want to do aggressive testing. We don't want to traumatize that patient in any major degree, and that's pretty much what he said. We want to approach them calmly and thoughtfully with a with a uh, a perspective on on soothing rather than irritating. Alrighty, so there you've got the five potential subtypes proposed by Chris Payne. Hunter's lesions, bladder wall driven, pelvic floor driven, pudendal neuralgia, and functional somatic syndrome. Now I'll tell you my subtype. I am functional somatic syndrome primary. Absolutely. This explains my life. Now I get it. Now I understand why I was struggling with so many funky things in my 20s and 30s. So from a daily standpoint, I live with the intention every day of being as calm as I can be and not stressing myself out. That's just very, very important for me. And I avoid all chemicals. I avoid caffeines, all that sort of stuff. I am also pelvic floor primary because I have a torn muscle in my pelvis. And so I have to work on that every single day. In fact, it's spasming right now. I have to prioritize and get on my hands and knees and work on my muscles every single day to keep that under control. And then I'm bladder wall secondary. So what that means is I don't have bladder symptoms every day, but if one of the other gets tweaked out, my bladder can also become tweaked out. So I'm very careful about not traumatizing my bladder further. I do follow the IC diet. I, I can cheat a little bit now, but I don't cheat a lot because I know that the nerves in my bladder are sensitive and they will eventually fight back and I will feel it with a flare. So that's my subtype. Do you know what your subtype is? If you're looking for more information, please come visit our website, the IC Network. That's www.ic-network.com. If you go to our interstitial cystitis section, we have a free download area. And you can download the article that we wrote on this last summer to learn more about Dr. Payne's research and theories. I really truly think that this is the future for IC, and I hope that you will share those articles and that article with your care provider because it really could explain why some patients are not responding. They might not be being treated for the right problem. Like if it's your muscles, Elmeron isn't going to work. If it's your bladder wall, physical therapy might not be appropriate. We have to target the treatment appropriately. 
I wish you well. I hope that you're having a great day. And as always, you can email me directly through our website, www.ic-network.com. Thank you.